and we are ready to continue with uh, our quest into a postmodern architecture, urban planning and uh, society in general, because it's also about us uh, as professionals, as people who inhabit the spaces. And today, during this panel, we are going to be in a hybrid mode. Uh, half of our presenters are going to be here with us. And two, I hope, also join us via Zoom. So hopefully we will not have any technical troubles and everything will run smoothly. And we can also enjoy both of being uh, in the same intellectual uh, environment, uh, even though we are in different spaces now. And actually we would like to start and I hope it were Kristen uh, Angeman, uh, I'm sorry if I mis mispronounce the last name, uh, is already with us on Zoom. And we will have a very broad geography of our uh, research and uh, the questions that we are going to pose. And we are going to go uh, to uh, German, East German city Halle together with Kirsten. And it is my pleasure to introduce her to you. She has a diploma in engineering and he is a research she is a research and teaching assistant at the Chair for Construction and History of Architecture in Bauhaus Universitat uh, Weimar. And as we have four of us, uh, please be really strict with timing. And I'm going to be a tough moderator today uh, and really think about this 15 minutes uh, so we can all enjoy the great discussion afterwards. So we will hear all of three, uh, four presentations and then move into general discussion. So please keep your questions. And uh, Houston, uh, the screen and floor is yours. If you can hear me. Yes, perfect. Yes, okay, then I start the screen sharing. So I hope you can see it, I can see it, so <laughs> everything should be all right. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, for the invitation today to join you, if uh, only online, and that you've gone through all the hassle to do it in this hybrid format. Thank you very much. So I will start with two apologies, the first being that I can't be here with you today, and uh, I'm now here online in Weimar at university. And the second one, you can maybe hear it, I have a very strong cold and I hope that um, you can understand me and sorry for my voice that's a bit rusty. Um, today I will take you... Kristen, can you hear us? Or it looks like a problem with Zoom. Can have the conference bingo with all the things that happened with Zoom. <laughs> okay, Kristen, are you with us? The first urban planning model in the GDR was issued in the 1950s with the 16 principles of urban design. They were pre-formulated by party officials in Moscow and were adopted by the GDR government in July 1950. And as you can read here, uh, they draw up a model where urban planning had to be based on the principles of organicism and on the consideration of a city's historical structure. We will get back to that later. So this, these 16 principles represented the first change of the urban model from the modern structured and widespread city, as it was still pursued right after the Second World War, to the model of a compact city with uh, the most important and monumental buildings right in its center, according to Soviet model. This might be best exemplified by uh, Stalin Allee, um, the first construction section being with a, in a monumental classicist style, as you can see here. But actually, uh, this model relatively quick became obsolete with the so-called turnaround in construction in 1954 and the shift towards industrial prefabrication. 
In the following phase, modernist perceptions of urban design and architecture dominated the construction scene, resulting in residential areas with housing blocks and city centers with solitary public buildings. And this shift might be best illustrated with the second uh, construction period of the Stalin Allee, then called Karl Marx Allee, uh, which you can see, and I hope you can see my um, arrow here, this second section right up to Alexanderplatz in Berlin as really the city center and the traditionalist uh, axis in uh, the background here in this picture. This overall uh, modern concept of urban design was specified in a series of successive guidelines, which, however, did not attain the rank of the 16 principles from a legal point of view. The adoption of the housing construction program, under which 3 million apartments were to be built by 1990, led to a change in thinking. Now, also for economic reasons, the existing housing stock was to be excluded in urban development, uh, included, was to be included in urban development. Plans for the large scale redevelopment of city centers were suspended. However, new housing construction initially, initially concentrated on the large housing estates on the outskirts of the cities, as you can see here in Berlin or Leipzig. In order to push development in the inner cities, Work began in 1980 on a new guideline for architecture and urban development. There were lengthy discussions in the Ministry of Construction, the Building Academy and the Union of Architects. And in the end, in 1982, those long title, Principles for the Socialist Development of Urban Design and Architecture in the German Democratic Republic were adopted. These 82 principles formulated a guideline for urban planning that can be paraphrased with the catchword city as a whole. City as a whole, culturally and economically, and uh, very important according to plan. The overall organism of the city was understood as something inherited that had to be renewed by incorporating the existing and thus no longer as something to be built newly completely. The understanding of the city was thus a holistic one which propagated a move away from the functionally separated city toward a mixture of functions, especially in order to exploit the existing technical and social infrastructure in the inner cities. The economic primacy over architectural and urban planning issues essentially determined the principles though, and if only because they were to serve primarily the fulfillment of the quantitative goals of the housing construction program. However, those 82 principles were not an actual architectural model. It remained open how the desired harmonious combination of old and new was to be solved in terms of design, especially under the conditions of industrialized and typified building. To demonstrate uh, the solutions planners and architects came up with in the 1980s for this urban renewal, I will take you to the city of Halle that stands as a universal but yet special example. Being the capital of one of the 14 districts of the GDR, it was situated in an industrial zone dominated by the chemical industry. As for many of those uh, district capitals, large-scale plans and somewhat utopian plans were drawn up in the late 1960s, which would have led to an almost complete reconstruction of the city center. And the city uh, of Halle, the city center, was this kind of bean-shaped structure that you can see here surrounded by a ring road. And you can see that, um, uh, or you have to imagine that um, the kind of medieval city core was still in a kind of... Uh, a good shape after the Second World War because it wasn't uh, very much destructed, but actually in a bad shape condition-wise. And the 1960s plans wanted to uh, yeah, reconstruct almost all of it and also with high-rise buildings. Those plans were never implemented so, and the only ensemble that you can see today in the uh, inner uh, city was uh, Teman Square, which would be right here in the uh, southeastern corner of the city core, 
which was kind of the entrance to the city and also the starting point of the flyover that went to the new town Halle Neustadt. During the 1970s, the city was in a typical state for that time. Housing construction took place on the outskirts of the city and the nearby new town, Halle Neustadt, um, was uh, with its, um, no, I lost my line, sorry. Um, so it took place in the outskirts of the city and in the new town and the formerly impressive old town was in a state in the, of decay. At the same time, the chief architect of the city, Gerhard Kröber, drafted an overall concept for the image of the city. He preceded his model for Halle with a comprehensive analysis of the city in which he primarily asks about its characteristics. He presents uh, the contradictions between the pressure for change on cities due to uh, the demands of modern traffic, but also the desire to preserve the old cities. The basis of Gruber's model derived from these considerations is the identity of the city, which he defines according to Kevin Lynch as individuality or wholeness and not as conformity with something else. So he says the identity of a city, its distinctiveness is expressed not only in its cityscape, which is marked by certain characteristic buildings, but each city has also a particular structure that is unique to it alone and distinguishes it from all other cities. Yet again, it is only certain essential structural elements that constitute this distinctiveness. And so for him and his model of Halle, he wanted to preserve uh, the market square and the other uh, portion of the market here in the West, the ring road around the city center and the radial shopping streets. And all uh, what was left uh, blank or white could also be uh, redesigned with modern structures and with more open structures. The revision of the general development plan from 1977 uh, incorporated both the housing program's goals and the considerations of Kröber. The revision provided for clear territorial distribution of new housing construction to the outskirts and of modernization and reconstruction in the inner cities here with this vertical stripes. Although initially ruled out as a new development site, major interventions on the old town were already foreseeable at this time. For example, here in this black spot in the uh, southwestern corner of this city core being. In 1981, a change took place, sorry, with a competition for the Bruno's Water building area in the southwest of the old town, this uh, black spot that I just showed you. The three prize winners clearly set themselves apart from the development concepts of the mid 1970s. The ground plans do not show row buildings, but rather perimeter block like structures, which in part connect to the existing buildings, close the street walls to the adjacent streets in angles or curves, which sounds uh, very simple, but was a huge development. And all of that within the system of prefabricated panel construction. The competition can be seen as a kind of a key moment for the further development of Halle's inner city. Bruno's Warte advanced to becoming the blueprint for further urban development in Halle and initiated a change in urban planning principles. Further areas were investigated and designated as construction areas in the course of 1982. Finally, the entire old town and uh, adjacent areas like uh, those around here uh, were divided into 11 construction areas where redevelopment, modernization, preservation, and also new construction was planned. Five of these areas were completed until the German reunification in 1990, uh, of which two of them I will discuss now. So we start with the Bruno's Warte area, which was built between 1984 and 85. It attracted attention throughout the GDR. 
And in fact, uh, Wolf Brandstedt, the architect and his team, succeeded in achieving a differentiated design of the area, although a prefabricated building series was used. By inserting conical elements, it was possible to approximately follow the former course of the streets in the area. As further adaptations to the surrounding buildings and to individualize the area, several design elements developed for the site were implemented. Particularly noteworthy are the glazed lodges, which provided also noise protection for the apartments located directly uh, on the high road in the south southern area of uh, the site. A top floor clad with red tiles to create the impression of a roof, bay window elements and windows that go around the corner. While most of the windows were painted in dark brown, Light shades of blue and red were chosen for the slender steel frame windows of the loggias, which provided for a contrast to the warm grey tones of the washed concrete facades. The height of the buildings was varied with tower-like superstructures. And there are two points of reference here. On the one hand, the steel framed loggias and the windows around the corner can be read as paying homage to the architecture of new objectivity of the 1920s, which had left its mark in the city of Halle, but not on the site. On the other hand, this fort-like impression of the buildings is a reference to the former city wall, which ran along the site. However, the overall layout of the buildings only loosely refers to the former structures of the small, uh, the small plots with courts and annexes, and the building line is uh, set back from the original one running around here. The second uh, construction area that I want to present here, Domplatz, meaning the square at the cathedral, was built in the most sensitive area of the town. It was built from 1985 on until uh, 89. And it ran from the historic market square here up to uh, the cathedral and to the north to Moritzburg Castle. The buildings follow the historic course of the street much more closely than in Grunoswarte, and the buildings are smaller in scale too. The roofs are predominantly flat, but there are also um, kind of mansard roofs. Many extra elements have been incorporated, such as concrete slats over the roof terraces to imitate the pitch roof. And special, however, are the many parts of the buildings in clinker brick. Uh, they form staircase access. Yeah? yeah um, you have two more minutes. Yeah, I will uh, get to, uh, quickly through this. Thanks. Um, they form uh, yeah, also window shapes and especially this broken pediments. So um, we can actually say that uh, in this part we have a kind of uh, yeah, comparison between uh, a medieval structure for the, um, for the uh, layout and those uh, very contemporary motifs like the broken pediment. And sometimes there's also uh, individual buildings like those uh, two fill-ins in the gaps between the panel structures and the historic buildings to make this uh, kind of uh, gap a bit more harmonious. So, and that's why I will skip this part here and come to my conclusion. Um, the urban and the architectural design of uh, the inner city construction areas in Halle can be adequately described by the terms context and continuity, is my point here. Continuity is kept in a tangible and in an intangible way. There's a continuity of space as the profiles of the streets, their course, corners of perimeter blocks, spatial dimensions and heights were preserved or at least oriented on uh, from the preceding buildings. An intangible continuity is represented by the linking to local building traditions or the history of the individual building site. And you don't have to go that far back in history, but there are several elements which relate to the architecture of the 1920s. But also the history of the site was implemented in the new designs, like the tower, uh, like upper floors at Brunsbarter resembling the city wall. For the actual design of the buildings and facades, context plays a major role. 
The bodies of the buildings are shaped according to the surrounding city, using vertical window formats, zoning the facades and ground floor, upper floors and roof. The facades are then designed small scale with varying surfaces, materials and colors, yet retaining an overall unity. Unfortunately, those efforts have been obliterated by refurbishments in recent years that completely renewed the exterior of some of the structures. Both context and continuity result in a form of contextualism that considers the historic context as well as the physical one. It is complemented with the postmodern method of alienation and appropriation of historic elements, here specifically the Baroque pediment as a cipher for historic and at the same time contemporary element. Thank you very much. Dear Kristen, hope you can hear the round of applause that you got from the yeah, audience. <laughs> yeah, and we are moving for, uh, further, but afterwards we will have uh, a common discussion with all of the presenters. And now uh, we are back here in the room, uh, back in Kiev in different senses, uh, not only in space, but also like we are going to talk about Kiev, but about Kiev from the different times. And uh, this presentation is prepared by two speakers, but as far as I understand, uh, we will have one presenter. So let me first introduce Brent, uh, who is not with us, but who also contributed to this paper. Uh, Brent Ryan, who is Associate Professor of Urban Design and Public Policy Head in the City Design and Development Group at uh, MIT. And uh, his colleague, Igor Vlasenko, um, will present this paper. And Igor holds master uh, in uh, urban studies from Malmo University and now works as coordinator of GIZ Integrated Development Project. So, uh, Igor, let's talk about Kyiv. Uh, yeah, thank you, Natalia, and thanks, Ariel. I would like to start with a round of thanks. Thanks to the conference organizers for this brilliant event. Also, thank you for the technical team who made my presentation possible with all of the technical constraints that we had. I will try my best to be on time, but we shall see if I will succeed. Indeed, I was never supposed to present this alone uh, because this uh, presentation is based on the outcomes of research during my Fulbright year at MIT of a brand. Ryan was my advisor and then eventually also became my, my co-author in a series of yet unpublished papers. Uh, yeah, today, uh, yes, great, you can see the screen. Uh, today I'm going to talk about, yes, indeed, about the Kiev context, uh, going very local here. And the title is Late Soviet Manga Projects in Contemporary Ukrainian Historiogra Historiography, the case of Kiev's 1,500 years anniversary. In fact, in this presentation, I will not address much neither manga projects nor historiography, uh, but I would be really willing to talk about both concepts uh, and during the discussion. I also, I think I am capable of really going through the first part of this presentation, like really rush through it, uh, because I think that many of these facts that, that will be showcased are actually, um, like, you, you are, I think, very well aware of them. So, part one is the communization. Here we can see Ukraine on the current political map of Europe. Before the 20th century, obviously, it was not like that. It was not an independent state. It was controlled by the empires, uh, Russian, Austrian, at some point, Ottoman empires. And uh, then gradually, over the course of the 20th century, it, uh, it was shaped by uh, more, more military conflicts uh, occupied by the Soviets uh, in the 1920s and then eventually gaining the current borders of the, the Second World War. This is very clear. Uh, what was less clear to me was like, how did Ukrainian cities become so Sovietized? in the very brief course of time, six, 70 years for some parts, as you can see, even 60 years. And I think that the answer is uh, uh, this deliberate policy that existed in the Soviet Union that was formulated as early as 1918, allegedly by Lenin himself, uh, in the famous degree, uh, decree on the monumental propaganda. Uh, there is like this story, something like the type of urban legend, that basically the idea came through the reading of uh, Tomasa Campanella's The City of the Sun and uh, the imagined socialist city that should be basically covered by different works of art and frescoes that are supposed to demonstrate the uh, socialist ideals. So this is uh, 
basically uh, the Soviets were really successful at that and very precise. Uh, the uh, propaganda was never like a, a bad word. In fact, it was a deliberate policy and was also very well elaborated. Uh, this is an illustration from this book, which I will address a little bit later on, uh, so you can see how, how, how elaborate it was actually. Uh, as a result of this policy, as, uh, as late as in 2012, right before the Euromaidan protests, but already after the Orange Revolution protests of 2004, uh, most of the toponyms in Ukraine were still very much Soviet. This is a map of, made by Texty, Orgue, um and Think Tank, and uh, basically a lot, a lot of the Soviet names uh, were still persistent. The situation has changed, however, very drastically after the Euromaidan public protest occupied the central core of this city, of Kiev, uh, which has led to an unprecedented, uh, uh, unprecedented chain reaction of toppling down Lenin monuments in February of 2014. Uh, which was pretty much uh, uh, bottom up and started by the first Lenin monument on Shevchenko Boulevard, which was demolished by the protesters on December 8th. Allegedly, those protesters who did that, they were representing probably the right wing part of the Euromaidan movement. As a result, uh, as Sergei Plohi uh, wrote uh, later on, uh, none of the 5,500 statues of Lenin that stood in the former state uh, remain today. Uh, later on, uh, the communization, basically toppling down of the uh, Soviet uh, symbolics in the urban space, uh, was uh, put uh, uh, put up as a part of Ukrainian legislation prepared by the Ukrainian Institute for National Remembrance, uh, headed by its then uh, director Volodymyr Vyatrovich. Uh, and uh, these four laws, especially the latest one, the lone conviction of communist and national socialist totalitarian regimes, uh, basically in, enabled mass removal of monuments, architectural decorations, and also a mass toponymic change, uh, mass renaming of streets, cities, public buildings, and so on. In 2017, in an interview to Mixed Journal, uh, Yatrovich has reported about 1,000 settlements being uh, renamed. So all of this gives us a sense of how massive first this uh, communization was, that it managed over a number of decades to produce so many symbolics and uh, toponyms, and also how sharp was the latest reaction to it, the, the communization campaign, which uh, has arguably started uh, back in the beginning of the 1990s, so even in the end of 1980s, but was really gaining its momentum during and after the public protests of uh, 2013, 2014. Um, so why, why this part? Why uh, Kiev 1,500 years? Uh, well, we picked this case because we believe that it represents one of the high points in, the, in production of Soviet monumental propaganda in the city of Kiev, the capital of now Ukraine and back then the Ukrainian SSR. And uh, we also believe that this was an event of unprecedented scale and also of uh, a very vivid complexity of ideological messages that were ingrained into its legacy. So first starting like saying a very few words about where Ukraine or Ukrainian SSR, still Soviet Republic was standing at around 1970s, 1980s. This was a period of, like as is written here, as a, a really of a demographic boom and also a boom of industrial agricultural economy, but it was already coming to its peak and slowly, uh, slowly entering the stagnation phase. And then later in the 90s appeared uh, very uh, drastic and, and even, even tragic. Uh, so I think uh, out of all these tables, only the one on the top left is important. This is the uh, statistics of books in Ukrainian published uh, in, the, in the different decades. And you might not see it very well because it's, it's quite, the font is quite small, but uh, uh, I can read that in the 1976 and 1980s, you can see one of the lowest percentages well, actually, this book's published in Ukraine, only 27, 24% compared to 60, 
1958. So this was a peri period of very rapid Russification that happened very late uh, in the in the actually Soviet history. Um, now the the holiday itself, because uh, Kiev indeed celebrated uh, 1,500 years in 1982 as part of uh, a number of other city anniversaries such as Moscow, 800 years that were very common in the uh, Soviet Union. Some cities such as Yerevan even claimed that they would be even older than that. And this was like uh, in fashion back then. But also uh, commenting on this date choice, which was very strange because uh, uh, no one was really very serious about it. The head of Soviet Ukraine, Sherbitsky, openly said in the interview that we pick a suitable date. And if our uh, Basically, if those who come after us uh, will object it, they can celebrate their own anniversary. Uh, but at the same time, it seemed to be very important to the Soviet to celebrate it then. And there is a reaction in the article by Omelan Pritsak, a noted Ukrainian hist historian in the Diasporian journal. Uh, sorry, I forgot the name of the journal. But anyway, so he was claiming that basically he was may maybe making a conspiracy, but he was making a claim that first the date was incorrect. And then secondly, apart from the official coincidence of dates, like this was 16th anniversary of USSR, and this was also very close to 1980 Olympic Games in Moscow, that there were also some other dates that the Soviets would rather forget, such as 50 years since the famine of 1932, 33. And also he said like, well, if you wanted an accurate historical date, why don't you pick a Christianization of Kiev Rus, which was actually very close in time, which would happen like very, uh, in, in, in the same decade. So there is a lot of uncertainty about this date, but what is very clear that this date was celebrated very uh, richly and broadly. And for analyzing it, we have used a number of sources, like one group of sources were uh, actually personal memoirs, because uh, it seemed to be in fashion for the leaders of Soviet Ukraine to produce them. The guy who was the uh, head of the organizing committee of the celebration, he produced a memoir called The Bur Burden of Memory, which is like 2,000 pages long. Um, yeah, uh, when we were trying to actually realize to enable the celebration, uh, it was very apparent to us that this could not be authorized by the local authorities in Kiev, although this was the official claim that the local party committee actually authorized the celebration. But it, did never, it never controlled the budget like that, or it never had the decision power, uh, making power like that. So, I, in fact, the Academy of Sciences was uh, one of the key stakeholders. Uh, the one in Moscow and also the one in Kiev that were closely cooperating and uh, one of the important claims that they were willing to defend with this holiday was uh, the non-Normanic uh, nature of so uh, Slavic civilization, basically uh, advocating the kind of the strengths of the uh, Slavic civilization, how it emerged on its own without any foreign, especially Western influences. So it was important for them to advocate that Kiev is older than, than it then appears. There was also like interesting links on a personal level between Academy of Sciences and the central government and the government of Ukrainian SSR, such as this guy in the almost in the middle, Petro Trenko, who was at some point the deputy head of the Academy of Sciences. And then prior to that, he was deputy vice minister and he was responsible for, for, for many of the, basically for, for the celebration to happen. It was also authorized by the highest leadership both of the Soviet Union and by of Ukrainian SSSR, negotiated directly between Sherbitsky and Brezhnev and Leshko. Um, at the same time, it was of course also executed on the local level. Uh, Valentin Zgursky was back then um, in a position equivalent to mayor of Kiev, although he was never elected. He was appointed to be the head of uh, Kiev uh, state, uh, city state administration, Kiev city hall. And uh, sometimes he claims that he was actually the author of the idea. And you can actually hear from him right now. This is one of his late interviews. He's very elderly here. Uh, it is in Russian. I will provide a short recap after he speaks. No? No, well, понятно. Well, it's okay about housing. The Museum of Lenin, Ukrainian house now, right? The Museum of Great Patriotic War, okay. 
the stadium may be, the pitch, the football pitch, the central stadium was totally reconstructed. Well, we have been prepared for the Olympic Games, so we... Well, it used to be better and bigger than now. It was bigger for 25,000. You created Podil, the central part, and the Andreevsky descent. Yes, we did it. We strengthened the system of housing communal... Uh, Basically, he is reflecting upon one of the key projects enabled by the celebration. They were very versatile, from historical reconstructions on Kiev Padil to war memorials such as this giant motherland statue, uh, to reconstruction of stadiums and so on. I always find it fascinating how in this interview he never wants to really get credit for this bigger project and he always wants to talk about housing and routine basically city management because this is actually what, what, what he did and the, the other things were not his jurisdiction really. So we have counted 808 projects in total. Uh, the number comes from the document on the top right. So basically there was a decree by the Council of Ministers of Ukrainian USSR that listed all of these objects that had to be constructed for the celebration. And while many of them were just very utilitarian, although you can never be sure uh, because many even usual urban design typology, as you know from Owen Hedrily of the Soviets, can actually bear some ideological significance. But many of them were, as we say, openly ideological, and these are the ones that we analyzed closely. Actually, uh, coming already to the messages that the Soviets wanted to convey into the celebration, uh, the two are displayed here. So this is the kind of one of the main ceremonies of the celebration in the Central Republican Stadium in Kiev. This is the first one, and it basically, this is the one about the historical age of the city, and it displays the message of Mestinovika, which from Russian means together for centuries to come. And basically this is about the unity between Ukrainians, Russians, and Belarusians. So this holiday was used as a kind of starting point of these all three kind of states and nations, and also as a claim for them to be in the same state in the Soviet Union. Uh, the second one, uh, rather more official, was the 60 years of USSR. So this this sets, uh, yeah, how I have to be like, a, yeah, I have to rush, oh no, uh, I'm not even at the middle. Um, yeah, so we were able to single out like four groups of uh, those, um, the logical narratives, as they call them, that we wish to uh, discuss uh, for this occasion. Uh, and uh, there were like numerous projects linked to them. But currently, since we are short in time, we will only focus on the four very iconic projects. I think one thing that uh, unites them is that they are all uh, situated along this uh, right bank of Kiev, this historical bluff. Roman Chebrivsky writes a lot about that, saying that basically this is always a site for representation of power in Kiev. There are like several dozens of different uh, buildings and monuments and all of them were somehow used for s s certain statements. Uh, so we were trying to basically look at these objects produced by the anniversary and see whether, like how they are perceived by the, the communizers and whether they are actually part of the, whether any, how affected by the decommunization law. The first one is the monument to the founders of Kiev. Hopefully you, you are aware of, of it quite well. They, it appeared in many occasions, like for instance, one of the, on the interim currency of Ukraine in the 1990s. But most importantly, I will emphasize this here, that it was uh, uh, used on the website of Ukrainian Institute for National Remembrance, which is supposed to be the communization watchdog. And it's put uh, not on the, you see on the right, uh, not on the red side, the decommunal side, but, but on the right side, which is uh, basically uh, an icon for the group of monuments that have to be preserved. So we can say that basically all of the historical reconstructions were appropriated, they're never perceived really as Soviet, and they are celebrated, in fact. This does not only relate to the monument or to the founders, same with the Golden Gate, reconstructed churches, old Podil, and so on. Secondly, the narrative of the friendship of the peoples with the friendship of the people's arc, a giant titan and steel structure. Uh, it has been uh, appropriated uh, for numerous occasions. It, was, it, it is still pretty intact, but it was often uh, 
as we say it, annotated. And one of the interested uses for the arch was uh, basically the uh, uh, the interim uh, uh, European village project. So basically, there were attempts to present the arc not the not as the unity of the Soviet peoples, but the unity between Ukraine and perhaps European nations or, or, or the EU. Also, the rainbow color signified the the creation of the arch for the Eurovision Song Contest. Uh, so it was called back then an arch of diversity. So basically, uh, it is being appropriated in many ways. And with the later one, with the crack, it it is literally the crack in the friendship between uh, Ukraine and Russia. The two monumental groups beneath the arc are much more problematic. Uh, I have no time to for that, but please ask me about that. <laughs> Uh, then basically what we see in the war memorials and the most vivid of them, of course, Mother Motherland Monument, it has also been in the same fashion redecorated. Also one of the major endeavors was like putting, installing this giant flag of Ukraine uh, last year. So basically it was also annotated as Ukrainian and somehow observed. Also importantly, war memorials are specifically protected from decommunization. They cannot be decommunized. There is an exception in the law for them. And then finally, uh, the Ukrainian house, Lenin's museum, one of the three Lenin-related objects during like along the axis between Kreshatek Maidan, the, the urban core of Kiev. Uh, this is the one, the, the last one standing because the monument, the monumental group on the Maidan with Lenin was uh, uh, basically, it was eliminated long ago in the 1991. Uh, the uh, another monument on the Shuchenka Boulevard, as you see, you saw in the previous pictures, was demolished by the protesters, and that one was actually cleared of any memory of Lenin, but it was put to other uses. Like uh, it, this, this object is still in the limbo. You can say it's used for rice exhibitions, but also some years ago it was proposed as the new office of the President Zelensky. This project was never realized, but it was still. It's still being discussed. This is the last slide, so this comes comes some relief. Um, yeah, basically, yeah, we just uh, showcased the coexistence of historical and modern socialist narratives in the late Soviet monumental propaganda. They coexisted, and I would argue that the historical part was more interested for the officials than the, actually the formal kind of socialist part. It was really exciting for them. You can see it in the memoirs that they wrote, in the interviews that they, they have given. Also that many popular and critically accepted sites of historical Kiev were recreated by the Soviets. It's also that like Kiev was, and Ukraine were really central in this whole Soviet historiography. I was not able to say much about that, but you can say like if this is the start of this common civilization, it's a very... Uh, kind of holy and, and important spot and also the way how celebration was organized also have proven that and finally that we claim again without probably not too many arguments in this presentation that some Soviet narrative some Soviet heritage can be viewed through the post-colonial lens we are aware of the whole debate around that but we think that in some cases it can be productive at least to, to, to try this lens and then finally and very I think we can say with certainty that the spatial effect of the communization, if you are not looking at the monument of Lenin's or toponyms, they are in fact appear to be moderate and they have been largely focused on annotating and a lot is still intact. This is especially, uh, I think the reason for that is that also a lot of uh, Sovietness lines not on architecture or monumental art scales, it lies on the urban planning and urban design scales, and those scales were never really properly addressed by those who, 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 who took such, uh, such goals. Yeah, I will not steal more time. Yeah, th thank you for your attention. Yeah, I'm open to the discussion. Thank you, and I'm sure there would be a lot of questions. Uh, and now we are moving from Kyiv to Lviv also in different senses, uh, especially and also to Sofia Diak, who is going to uh, join us via Zoom. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce her, uh, my colleague from the Center for Urban History. Uh, Sofia holds a PhD from Polish Academy of Science. She is historian and the director of the Center for Urban History. I uh, hope we can see Sofia now on one of the screens.
Do you see me? No, we can hear you. <laughs> well, um, mm -hmm, that's already good. <laughs> so I will. Um, do you? Okay, I will start screening the sharing the screen, and uh, if you let me know if um, it's not there yet, it's not there yet. We believe the technical uh, team will help us. It will catch oh, yep, up. yep. It looks like that something appeared. Okay. Oh, we can see you now. Well, good. <laughs> okay. Least, yeah. And hello. Yeah. Hello, everybody, and thank you for accommodating me for Zoom. Uh, I'm very sorry to miss this wonderful conference um, um, offline in offline format. Uh, so thank you for all your efforts um, in making this speech and presentation possible. Um, so that's a fairly long title of my uh, presentation. And um, I would like to focus um, immediately on uh, that it will look at one specific case, um, which I summarized in my first slide. So it's, um, it's rather obscure, not um, housing district in the city of Lviv, which is not uh, the biggest one or the most known. Uh, but I think that looking at it actually helps to trace um, dynamic in the way the city was imagined as a whole and uh, imagination about old and new uh, became uh, mainstream in the discussion um, of the 70s and 80s. So we do have the case of uh, um, the, the mass housing which was awarded with a prize, uh, the, um, the main prize of the Soviet Ukraine um, uh, for different literature, music and art, but also architecture. And in 1980, it went to the Srebrenica, the Silvery, which was designed in 70 to 76, built several years later, and actually was not really a big one. So it's 11 square hectares, almost 1,500 apartments and around 5,000 inhabitants. And the authors, um, the Novi Pidvisne, Ludmila Nivina and Sergei Zemyankin, were coming from the main planning institution in the city, the deep um in Lviv. Um, so uh, the model here shows the, the shape and the the scale gives you a bit a glimpse into what um, authors um, planned. Um, and uh, in my presentation, I will not go into the detailed analysis of the form and the speciality, but rather in the discourse and the thinking. And what thinking about this district tells us about thinking about the city as a whole. Uh, so the key, the key, uh, my key argument here is that this very far away on the outskirts, located on the outskirts, uh, mass housing district, um, not only uh, shaped relation with the city center, but actually proved that the city center, the old pre-Soviet built environment, uh, became internalized and creatively reused um, in the city like Lviv. Um, so, so it's in other ways, it uh, does not only reflect the ways mass housing discussions and criticism of mass housing of the 60s, but reflects a shift in thinking about the city as interconnected environment as a whole, as a continuity and circulation, and most of all, as a distinctive place where relations matter, where attachment and emotions matter. Uh, so this particular mass housing project referenced historic environment and um, in the 
city of Lviv, it was very special, not unique, but special case as um, it showed the success one can say, or um, in accommodating and appropriating the pre-Soviet urban environment in the city, which was marked by border change after the World War II and by displacement. So if we would zoom out a bit and see several shifts. So I would like to locate the 70s or this 1980 moment in at least two shifts. So first we do have a moment when Lviv as a city comes into the Soviet Ukraine and the Soviet Union, a city which was previously belonged to interwar Polish Republic. And the question is actually what to do with this new and physically undestroyed city. So what to do with the old. And the whole period after the war of about 15 years, we would say in the context of socialist realism by around the city center, what to do with it, how to do the new city center. So that's a very short summary. So by the 1960, the city actually, um, the center was, while the attention moved away from the center with mass housing, large mass housing uh, projects on the city's outskirts, the question what to do with the city center still remained. And uh, at the conference held in Kiev in 1960, the, um, um, an architect from Lviv Polytechnic already mentioned by Natalia Andrei Rudnitsky basically suggests that let's take the principle of micro district and impose it onto the old districts of the city because the city's old build, old built environment of cities in Western Ukraine is a challenge. So and how do we do deal with this challenge? We can uh, micro districting it. So we take it from, from the micro district and impose it into the city center. So that actually did not really happen, but what happened by the 1980, actually a reverse that the structure of the city uh, center became an inspiration to rethink and re renew and uh, revisit mass housing and think about the city as a whole. And this moment I am uh, exploring. So as I already mentioned, so this is the city, the context that you have to keep in mind, which um, integrated into the Soviet Union as a result and a part of World War II. It actually had these challenges of accommodation and um, as a place of rupture with mostly new inhabitants, with due to post-Holocaust and post-displacement. It's also a place of competition, socialist and capitalism, new and old, progressive and retrograde. Uh, it is also a place that, to tell the story how this from competition to appreciation, Lviv as a major Soviet heritage city, and also from rupture, mainly in terms of people, uh, uh, to continuity, how pre-Soviet uh, built environment becomes and an inspiration. So the Sribliste, so the 1980 package um, had a number of documents and these documents are revealing in the way architecture and the project involve different institutions, different actors, and in a way different spheres of circulation. So we do have three institutions that recommend uh, the mass housing Sribliste for the for the state price. And all of them, the institute that designed it, the executive uh, municipal um, uh, council and the union of architects rather, fo rather focus on functional while reflecting aesthetical and reflecting this, this, this um, I mean, critical attitude to mass housing, monotonous, I mean, all what we know, stressing that this project offers new image, offers creative special planning uh, and uh, unrepeated image. So the words that we would, uh, we would spot here and there, then we talk about 
what happened after socialist modernism. Uh, but the authors uh, were much more explicit in what they wanted to achieve. So the first thing that they referred to was beauty. So beauty was an opening statement for them and peculiarity. So how you achieve peculiarity uh, in new construction, in new construction, which is not a singular building, but a typical and a mass housing building. And the solution they, they found was inspiration from historic built environment. And here I would quote that they said that they were using the best spatial approaches and specificities of the best examples of the city's built environment and referred to dynamic silhouettes, changing and flowing spaces, relatively small and cozy courtyards, passages, ways, corner sections and walkthroughs that all of them are resembling the gates in old parts of the city. And so walking through. And in their belief, this, um, this resulted in creative, in creating atmosphere, something that older or previous um, housing lacked. Uh, a new distinct unique Lviv atmosphere, colorate, Lvivsky colorate. Um, so they further, they moved on and by 83, that basically this inspiration from the city center and the, became their main argument in presenting the, the, the project to, to professional milieu. So that's Architectura SRSR, uh, 1983 uh, publication and an article which was authored by one of the authors, Novi Pidlisny, who created, who referred to their, to their team project as something that um, used traditions, repeating cozy courtyards, uh, pedestrian walks through. And the bigger argument was that this is not just an experiment. So this is a something which, um, which shows the continuity, the something that relates to existing built environment. And this is a way to uh, secure uniqueness of our cities, of each city. Um, so uh, the project was fairly mediated. And I think that sometimes, you know, we don't, so we don't often have um, um, references from the users and users are critical uh, critical category both in thinking about architecture and the way that we have their voices here so in this case we do have some um, some um, samples of what inhabitants were or users were thinking so they do they do appreciate they did appreciate as one of them that his district did not resemble other districts in Lviv. So this notion of uniqueness. Um, it was also noted that the users were not confined as a category to those who were living inside of the housing, but also those who were looking at it for this, at this mass district um, um, from outside as neighbors, so from their windows. So we, have, we here have, uh, a voice of from the family living opposite and enjoying the view. And the first district in Lviv that gives a statical pleasure for everybody. So, um, however, you know, um, just a, a short note to that, it was not at all, uh, all positive. And we do have, there's a note saying that there are problems and these problems are most technical and in finishing. And uh, even more importantly, that they um, learned that inhabitants learned from the press. So the, um, the construction and the district was not only a um, realization in physical space, it was also a media event. So for public, the, uh, the district was communicated in, or in, in media as something um, 
unique here. We have Nepoforne, unrepeated, unique, um, uh, unique Sriblisti, the unique silver, the silver one. And that's the growing um, discourse on how to be distinguished, on how to be singular, something that is most original and the best and the most perfect in the whole country, something. Um, and this push for locality, which is a, I mean, a key ca characteristic and probably a key side for um, analyzing uh, late socialism. Um, here we do have this in-between moment because we're talking about projecting in the early 70s and we have a series which is called not only experimental and typical, but actually by creatively working with it, it's given by media uh, um, a title Vista. And, the, uh, and not yes. by the projection, yes. too by, by designing it, but by using it. Yes. Can you so, um, and going to a final part of my presentation. So, in localizing, was a very much media. So, the authors and the media really created this uh, and emphasized that how the connection between the old city and the uniqueness and um, um, and how the how this connection proved to be both a success and um, and something that shows for uh, for the future. So local press uh, repeatedly emphasized how the atmosphere, the beauty, uh, the mood, um, and and most of all, the traditions, creative reusage of traditions. And one of the sites for this, um, um, and the, was the fact that such development was possible only in Lviv, or not accidental, not only in Lviv, but actually not accidental. And here, um, the, se the, the second part of my argument is that this localization in Lviv is a co corresponds, this new construction corresponds is interconnected with the, another major development in the Soviet and socialist countries and also globally, but also in Lviv, it's a heritageization and Lviv as a heritage city. So 1975, uh, Lviv becomes historic and architectural Sophia, reservation. Sophia, can you hear us? Time is running. Yes, so I'm finishing up, basically. Yes, thank you. Um, and um, the uh, it was the second in Ukraine and the first in size. It was also a center for one of the centers in Soviet Union of exploring what to do with heritage. Um, here is a comment by the editor of Architectura SSSR, like um, acknowledging what was done in Lviv in terms of heritage preservation in 1982. So the, finally, the courtyard so is a very unusual place, and I would argue that probably very illustrative because in the post-war period, courtyards in the old district of um, capitalist city is a symbol of decay and something that has to be overcome. And it becomes in the 70s an inspiration of what you can do in the new district. So um, a site to think about uh, relations between people, about coziness, about pleasure, and about um, distinctiveness. And final conclusions, rather notes, I would actually, um, um, the, the research that I was doing um, uh, for this conference is that uh, while looking at the realization in um, so the, the late Soviet period basically pushes us to think not only on Soviet city, not only as uh, something that was built in the Soviet period, but rather as a relation between the new and the old and the city as a whole. I think also another point is that focusing on place and locality also shows how 
ideas were circulating across different divides. And here I'm just noting that such uh, concepts as beauty, environment, adaptation were very strong and important in socialist realism. Uh, this course on architecture, and I think in particularly, uh, given the post-war period and the socialist bloc came out of the redrawing of borders, um, it is important or maybe like a possibility to show how um, this heritage turn, historical turn, uh, turn to revaluing city centers uh, place into uh, the uh, way cities which were incorporated, cities which, were, which had displacement of population were dealt with. Um, so, and, uh, and this pushes me to the final comment that in this discussion of the 70s and 80s, we could also look how this, this shift uh, created new networks and circuits of communication, more generally among cities and people working in the cities or pro projecting for the cities with significant parts of old built environment and also the cities which had ruptures like Lviv already discussed Vilnius, Wroclaw, Szczecin and the discussion of El Blanc and I think it could be an interesting avenue of discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sofia. And uh, we are going to discuss your paper as well as other papers after the case of Amblong that you just mentioned. And uh, yeah, together with uh, Florian Urban, we are going to travel there now uh, with uh, our conference and our thinking about the uh, 1980s. And last but not least, at the, our panel and also I think at the whole conference, uh, and the format of discussions and presentation is uh, Florian Urban. Uh, he is a PhD in history and theory of architecture, professor and head of architectural history and urban studies at the McIntosh School for Architecture at Glasgow School of Art. And uh, Florian, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you very much, Natalia, for the introduction and thank you for this invitation. I don't see my presentation on the screen yet. Um, is that... Well, maybe I can start out with a comment uh, in response to our last panel. I actually think in the assessment and reassessment of 1980s architecture that the term postmodernism shouldn't be overstressed. Um, first, because of the unhelpful and very obstinate discussion of people in the 1980s, Charles Jenks, etc., etc., which I don't think is, f is helpful for a historic reevaluation. Also, because of the difficulties to, um, um, of the protagonists at the time, many of whom rejected the term or were not even aware of it. I would rather stress the common concerns, and those were architectural, the concern with historic precedent, with a sem semiotic architecture, with quotations, but in the same way, programmatic ones such as bottom-up decision-making, small-scale development, um, uh, incremental development, or mixed use. So all these aspects I refer to as postmodern. And against this background, I would like to present the old town of Elblank in northern Poland, situated 60 kilometers from Gdańsk. And it boasts a rather unusual example of postmodern architecture. And at the same time, an example that was comparatively much more successful than the one that uh, Alicia presented uh, today in Poznań, uh, because in Elblank actually the attempts or the guidelines that were formulated in the 1980s actually were upheld for almost 30 years with only slight modifications. 
At the end of the Second World War, the famous old town with its over 600 historic buildings, 15th to 19th century, was reduced to rubble. And it was left largely ruined for more than three decades. In the 1980s, it uh, re-emerged as what was referred to as retroversia, retroversion, a house-by-house -house reconstruction on the historic block plan featuring historically inspired architecture. And this retroversion is an example of a postmodern project that grew from different roots than postmodern architecture in Western Europe and North America. Some of them were international, common concerns, and some of them were domestic Polish, as in particular the expanded discourse on historic conservation related to the Polish School of Historic Conservation. And this retroversion reconciled contradictory desires for post-functionalist planning principles, for visible historicity and local identity, despite a contested past. So these buildings can be classified as postmodern as they took up eclectic, neoclassical and vernacular influences and were based on small scale, mixed use and pedestrian orientation. But they're at the same time still clearly noticeable as contemporary. And somewhat more hidden but still evident are aspects that also gained significance in Western Europe at the time. Inner city regeneration, increasing private investment, municipal image marketing, and the increase of tourism. So this paralleled architectural approaches brought forward at the time by Rob Creer, Aldo Rossi, etc. But the parallels only to a small extent uh, related from direct influence and much more from a common concern that was shared across the Iron Curtain. So, um, the reconciliation of contradictory desires uh, for, on the one hand, historical continuity and on the other hand, creative reinvention was particularly significant in light of a traumatic past. I mentioned the complete destruction. The town belonged to Germany before 1945 and at the end of the Second World War, the German inhabitants were expelled and the town was subsequently repopulated by Poles who were often refugees themselves, originating from the regions that Poland was forced to cede to the Soviet Union. The reconstruction is also the story of a committed woman who sees the moment. Maria Lubotska Hoffmann was the head conservationist of Elblong Voivodeship and she was a driving force in the promotion of a house-by-house -house, um, reconstruction rather than the um, reconstruction from panels with system-built houses that had been decided by the local authority before. And it similarly shows the opportunities of increasing civic participation, for example, by the Yashtur Association that coordinated private individuals who were to become small-scale investors in these owner-occupied houses. So over the last uh, few um, uh, panels, we mentioned the similar organization of administration in most socialist countries where you had the, 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 the party hierarchy of the party committees and the civic hierarchy of the civil administration. And in case of conflict, almost in all socialist countries, the party had the last word. So the party committee was always more influential. But here, this retroversia resulted precisely from both impulses because uh, Ms. Lubotska Hoffmann was part of this civil administration. But at the, on the other hand, she was also a member of the Communist Party, of the PZPR, that ruled the country. And so were many of her supporters, both in Elblong and in the central government in Warsaw, who eventually somewhat pragmatically approved the rebuilding. So, and this is a big point, that as in many postmodern projects in Poland, the lines between opposition and state were blurred. There was not this clear uh, distinction between them and us that the opposition uh, 
um, pointed out at the time. So, um, in, while it was obviously influenced, the whole project, by the spirit of renewal connected with the Solidarity Trade Union movement, because Gdańsk was only 60 kilometers away, Lubotska Hoffman and the other supporters were not political activists. And likewise, the project was only indirectly affected by political events. It started several years before the foundation of Solidarity in 1980, and it gained momentum even after the protests were violently crushed with the declaration of martial law under Wojciech Jaruzelski in 1981. So this postmodernism of Elblanc relied on factors that were specifically specific to the Polish context. On the one hand, the long decline of the socialist regime. It wasn't like in Romania where it ended from one week to the other. Um, uh, also, uh, the high esteem of the conservation authority compared to other countries, possibly in some other socialist countries, uh, um, conservationists wouldn't have had the influence to modify a party decision. And um, uh, finally, the influx of private funds, which generated a fledgling market economy, which guaranteed the viability uh, of a long-term long construction project, despite a slumping socialist economy. So this unusual design appeared somewhat through the back door. So not by means of a single decree, but through a series of decisions taken over the course of more than one decade. And uh, you can see the continuity even across the modern, postmodern divide. Uh, uh, many Polish uh, uh, destroyed old towns were rebuilt in modernist uh, panel development, such as the nearby town of Malbork. And uh, as you will notice, uh, the architect of this modernist, uninspiring redevelopment of what used to be a beautiful historic town destroyed in the Second World War was Szczepan Baum, who 10 years later would become one of the driving forces in the um, rebuilding of Elblanc. So the turning point from, uh, uh, towards historically inspired architecture was what I refer to as the neo-historical panel plan. And obviously, there's also a prehistory of several years. But uh, strictly speaking, it was a series of plans for the street layout, for the design of some buildings, for zoning and for traffic planning. And it was passed by the Voyevodship Party Committee in 1978. And it made some references to the destroyed pre-war town, but it would have created a rather uninspiring urban environment, very different from that of a historic old town, because it foresaw the reconstruction of small blocks, more or less in the same um, shape of the historic buildings, but all with system-built panels. Only a small sample of about 25 buildings would have been rebuilt according to the historical shape. And interestingly, that's, it would, if it had been realized, it would have resulted in something similar to what was built in East Berlin at the time, also for a 750th anniversary, you know, that was, there's also very, very many parallels there. So this combination of reconstructing a small sample of historic buildings and then the rest in panel construction. But construction did not start. And some attribute this to the hesitance of uh, Maria Lubotska Hoffman to give the plan approval. But others uh, point out more that the town was hard pressed to come up with the resources for such an ambitious project. And this is what um, delayed it more and more. But in any case, resistance against this neo-historical panel plan grew progressively. And here again, we, we see like how Maria Lubotska Hoffman uh, sees the moment. She um, actually uh, mandated the excavation of the historic cellars in the old town from 1979 onwards. And they were the only portion of the historic old town that was actually still authentic. Um, they had been filled with rubble, but they were otherwise well preserved. And this gained the town national prominence. And um, Lubotska Hoffman could attack the neo-historical panel plan from a conservationist point of view. She said that actually in order to guarantee the um, 
the preservation of these only authentic vestiges of the historic town, you need a house by house reconstruction. And she used her own funds, basically a seed money, to, uh, um, to, to, to finance this. So a very interesting uh, turn in order to use historic conservation principles um, uh, to build something that was basically a reinvention just. And um, in 1983, she and her team worked out these conservationist guidelines, which extended beyond what would have been traditionally considered the responsibility of her, of her office. So she called for design using individual contemporary forms that did not disturb the historic scale and the atmosphere of old Elblanc. I can't really get into that, but the focus towards atmosphere, um, immaterial heritage is something that you would find both in the conservationist discourse in Poland and in the international disc uh, um, discourse. So there should be no illusion of historical uh, reconstruction. And the guidelines also mandated traditional high quality materials, so there was also this aspect of it. And here you see the difference. I mean, this is the same street before the Second World War and after, like the reconstructed place. So the postmodern buildings were designed by Stepan Baum and Richard Semka, as, as well as some others. Some of them who, who were actually quite um, well-known architects in Poland at the time. And only a portion of these buildings was completed by 1989 but the plan was largely upheld by subsequent city administration and the reconstruction continued. So the last portions basically were completed in the early 2020s, right, re very recently. So um, there is little evidence that actually this design process in the 1980s went along with a discussion of postmodern architecture, although Postmodernism, the term postmodernism was discussed in professional journals. It made it to the headlines of the journal Architectura two times in 1979 and in uh, 1982, but it had little direct relation to Elblanc. Here you can see the plan 113 buildings. Um, 61 of them were single-family houses and uh, the rest multifamily buildings. So rather large flats by socialist standards and commercial spaces, bars, restaurants, as well as shops and craftsmen workshops. And the rebuilding was uh, supported by the fledgling market economy, which had been gradually introduced in the early 1980s. And this marked a clear break from the socialist principles. And here we have this different, you know, gradual development similar to what was happening in Poland, that actually in, 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 in Poznan today, what we what we heard today by Alicia's presentation. Um, the municipality gave plots in the city center actually for free with the sole condition that um, the inhabitants would use private funds to build on them and potentially inhabit the resulting buildings. And these small-scale investors were often what the uh, communists with a derogatory undertone referred to as privatiarze, these private entrepreneurs, usually people who owned a shop or a kiosk or something. Many of, most of them were Elblanc residents, but also, they were not motivated exclusively by idealist commitment with the historic time. Um, uh, Lubotska Hoffman remembers that there were also speculators who rapidly sold their flats after profiting from the subsidies and never really had any intention in participating in community life. So, um, you can see this is actually one of the um, uh, blocks that was completed in the 1980s under the socialist regime. And you also see, I'm going to be quick, the difference to historic, real historic buildings and uh, the, port, mm, the, the aspect of reinvention, of creative reinvention, which parallels um, the analysis of uh, Kenneth Frampton or Lefebvre Sonis about critical regionalism that was discussed in Poland at the time as well. So, to conclude, these are projects from the 1990s.
the rebuilt old town in Elblanc successfully addressed the challenges of the context and it reconciled contradictory desires. And some of these desires were shared in many countries, such as the longing for a tradition and local identity in light of progressive modernization or the disappointment with functionalist urbanism. But others were particular to Poland and the local contest, the contested past in a town that had been German before 1945 and an expanded view on historic conservation and as well as the constraints and opportunities of a socialist government in decline, because this was precisely not a capitalist takeover where, you know, big developers would come in. Um, while it was eventually uh, financed by the market economy, it was initiated by state planning and conservation authority, and it relied on the strength of these authorities, which would not be the case after uh, the transformation. So master planning was not yet affected by real estate industry's short-term goals. And this changed significantly also in Elblanc. Currently, it is in, the town is increasingly a tourist destination and the rebuilt old town is its most important attraction. So in the context of this traumatic past, a historically inspired postmodernism was a convenient way to have the cake and eat it. Uh, on the one hand, the new architecture suggested historical continuity, but on the other hand, it acknowledged breaks and upheavals. There was no claim of accuracy or authenticity, and there was also no nostalgic idealization of the past. So references to the German period or to the merits of the merchant classes, because there was also the class aspect at the time, obviously, that prevented people from reconstructing this. Uh, they were neither neglected nor were they stressed, but blended into a forward-looking approach that was centered on future development and post-functionalist planning principles, small scale, mixed use, multiple actors. So in this respect, Elblanc attests to the power of postmodern architecture in reconciling conflicting desires and mediate the relations between inhabitants and the built environment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And we are now ready to proceed to our discussion and could I please ask technical team to show us our panelists from Zoom as well so we can all be together here at least in this hybrid format and uh, also we are privileged with a lot of time it looks like because I just checked the schedule and we have a plenty of time yeah, am I correct Alexander yes so I think our discussion could also raise some general questions from the whole day so we can all together talk about things of our common concerns but first let us pose the questions to the presenters and I hope there are few because for me personally it's a great story of well, dealing with the past, but what kind of past? For me, it's always an issue. How far do we look into the history in order to uh, find some inspirations? And for postmodernism, what kind of history? Is it a medieval history of our cities? Uh, is it um, a Renaissance history? Is it just a pre-war history? Actually, what history are we referring to uh, as researchers uh, when we are talking about historical turn? And uh, what kind of history was relevant for other actors, for the ar architects and planners uh, who are also looking for some kind of is inspirations? And I believe all of these presentations have different takes on this question. And also, I really appreciated how you um, see the people behind. So it's also a very human story uh, from the perspective of professional milieus, from the perspective of decision makers, from the perspective of people who live uh, in these environments. But those are just my general comments. And do you have any questions? Please raise your hands. Okay. So I 
I have the question. Uh, first question is to uh, to Kirsten, Kirsten Argenman, uh, regarding the the way how how it was constructed. Because uh, in Poland, generally, when the panel buildings were built, the distance between buildings and the layout was to be done in such a way that the crane can easily communicate between buildings. And in Eastern German cities, they were quite often filled in the, the narrow narrow streets, narrow plots. So how was this technically done? And to, to, to Jehor, I have the question which you requested on on this that uh, on the symbolic of this uh, this mo monument uh, monument by the by, by, by the arch, and also the other question that uh, that 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 I, I was also impressed because uh, in Warsaw some years ago there there was a, a, an exhibition about the Ukraine in 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 the festival. Also in their construction, and then the people from this uh, exhibition, who organized this exhibition, were saying about the the far destroying uh, uh, way of uh, of the communication in Ukraine. But but I, I think that I agree more more with you. That for example, in 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 Kharkiv or in Kyiv, in metro station, there is there is a metro station in Kharkiv by the tractors factories when there is I don't know like seven. Uh, uh, the, I, this uh, hammer and I don't know English way of uh, uh, sickles, which I think that could be very easy, easily uh, replaced by 73 zoops or something. And so, so do you do you think that it is uh, a thing that it is regarded as something in, in, important not to destroy the initial decoration, or there are other reasons? Okay, I think I will start as you addressed me first. Um, yeah, thank you for this question. Um, I can actually say that they did it the same as uh, in the um, in the outer skirts uh, developments. So they had those cranes, but it took a lot more effort because they had to switch the rails for the cranes a lot. Uh, I've seen the the plans for the equipment of the construction sites in the archive, so they were a bit uh, more elaborate than uh, uh, in like the uh, newly built um, construction areas. And um, yeah, I can only say it, it took an effort and it was uh, more time intensive and more cost intensive, but they actually used the same cranes as they used uh, in the green lawn development. Yeah, thank, thank you for your question. So to, to the first question, so beneath the arch, that is just like, uh, as, as I said, it has steel frame and then allegedly Titan tiles, very expensive. Uh, there are two monumental groups. One monumental group depicts uh, two workers. Uh, they are supposed to symbolize Russian and Ukrainian workers. Uh, when you look at it, you can actually not tell who is who. I think it's quite intentional. The other symbolizes the Peri Yaslav Treaty, 1654, if I'm not mistaken, uh, between the Cossack state of Bogdan Khmelnytsky and the Russian Tsar, when this Cossack state will, like became like eventually part of the Russian Empire. I think really this monuments, I mean, I, I think I've already made a lot of claims in the presentation that may not be very scientifically justified. Uh, I think that to me still this monumental group, it symbolizes somehow the decay of something that Terry Martin, Harvard historian, called, uh, like he called USSR the affirmative action empire. I think that it's quite evident that in the late USSR, it was no longer really like that. Uh, there can be different interpretations why it somehow went wrong. Uh, there is a lot of literature about that, but base, but definitely the nationality policy that was formulated in the 1920s uh, was breached already in the 1930s and then was really never n never quite the same. Also in the celebration kind of media, uh, I have written several articles. One of them is actually by this mayor of Kiev who was talking and he says openly about like how Ukrainian culture formed under the influence of superior Russian culture. I'm almost quoting. So I think this in this way, 
this particular narrative of friendship of peoples can really possibly be reviewed through the post-colonial lens as one of many lenses. Um, yeah, the second question, sorry, I have... It was on the question that... Yeah, 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 I remember it. I remember it. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I think that, again, that uh, this this whole, like, recent wave of decommunization, it was, there was a specific law for that. And this law was, like, it. this organization, UINP, Ukrainian Institute for National Remembrance, it created lists of persons, of institution names, organizations names that were banned. In, in one way, like this is very comprehensive. On the one hand, uh, it, it's very limiting. So the local authorities had to remove only those symbols that were in the law. And of course, the law said nothing about, as I said, about even architecture scale, but mostly about, about like urban design, urban planning scales, that they were non-existent, especially like metropolitan, like Kharkiv Metro, Kiev Metro is a monument to socialism itself. Like some part of it, like the central part in Kiev, of course, even to Stalinism, pr probably. Um, so, like, it's it's, it's very to, to hard to change it, this identity, and it didn't look like as if the decision makers behind the communization really thought about that. So maybe they did, but at least like the procedures that they suggested, they were somehow very inflexible in the, in this in this regard. So of of course. Like this is, uh, they, they had a, a limited uh, impact, although at the same time in the toponymic realm, like these three namings, like they were omnipresent, they have changed a lot. Like well, one small short comment there, I think that also it is interesting to review the communization from the perspective of, uh, of the other states that regained independence at some point, post-colonial or not. Uh, I think that like there, there are interesting books about that. For, for instance, the book for, uh, by, by Larry Vell about the uh, the signature urbanisms, how they build their own buildings of parliaments, let's say, uh, how they build whole new capitals, as many African states, and not only. I think Ukraine never really had this chance to create its own signature urbanism. Maybe except the Independence Square, Maidan, Nezalezhnosti. Like, I think that it's worthwhile thinking that it's the building of Ukrainian Parliament was designed in the 1930s by uh, Zabolotny, who then received Stalin's prize for that. So I think the, uh, thinking about the communization th th through such perspective, like, like there is no, no nothing to build. Everything was built for you. <laughs> Probably you can only demolish. It's very subjective. Yeah. Thanks a lot uh, for this terrific panel. Uh, my question is mainly to Sofia, but uh, perhaps somebody else would like to jump in too. I think one of the questions which we had in this conference both yesterday, with, for example, with Alexander's presentation and today um, a couple of times is this, this, this topic of uh, history, rediscovery of history, but also the kind of anxiety about the fact that this history is constructed and perhaps even in an arbitrary way. But at the same time, I think I, I would imagine that, that we would probably agree that it is not simply imposed. There is a certain negotiation of that history going on. And I think what, what, you, what I found interesting uh, uh, in your presentations, among the many things which I found interesting, is that you pointed out that the question of the media and uh, and not only professional media, but also mass media, and uh, and the question of the public opinion. And so I was wondering if you would have any thoughts about how uh, the media and the public opinion, however restricted and however controlled it was under under socialism, uh, to what extent it was, uh, you know, part of that negotiation. Because I, it seems to me that this is one of the uh, kind of topics which does emerge a couple of times in this conference, and I suppose it's kind of worth uh, reflecting about it. Thank you, Lukas, for this question and for picking up this angle. I think it's actually crucial. I will begin a little bit from um, from elsewhere. So, uh, namely from this, this should or should we not use postmodernism? I think that that's an open question. And one of the 
a thought I had that um, if we adopt this term, the price is that we kind of limit our ability to see the sphere and the communication or the like the texts and the media in which discussion takes place in Soviet or socialist societies or state. And I think it's slightly is different in a way that um, um, probably resembles the discussion of what is public sphere and how also public sphere is appropriate for uh, for as a concept to discuss or analyze socialist experience. Um, I would actually say from like my research into this like place focused, I would say that uh, there is a lot of communication and discussion. And I think that um, like to begin with, uh, there are conferences happening all the time. So, and the conferences and the discussions that are many, you do see very lively. And it actually starts from the post war years, in my case, and uh, continues into the 80s. So, um, so, this is a format of professional meetings, which probably is not very public, but still uh, each of the conference, most of the conference do have some spill out into local press, for example. And I think that I found that also very uh, important that architects or people who are in decision making about the city do write for local press. And uh, um, the, uh, um, I mean, in terms of communication and this angle of how city is, I mean, how city is communicated and how city is a precedent for the for, for community to get in conversation. Uh, and in the case of Lviv, but not only, I think it's even even more. Um, I mean, it's more exacerbated by the fact that you have to create community in this new place. But on the other hand, if you think about Soviet project, it's very much about creating community, creating, uh, um, you know, and that's 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 a key uh, key site also of late socialists. So what is how to combine this community locally, nationally, transnationally, and Soviet? And that's a big, uh, big challenge. Uh, and uh, I mean, and, and then finally, I would say that Soviet state, um, especially on local level is uh, producing or inspiring people to comment, to write. It's kind of even like, you know, you would maybe even say that it, uh, uh, there are public conferences, there are uh, the people that what actually what was part of denunciation in the, in the Stalinist actually becomes a, um, this letter writing um, process. And here, I mean, here this, in this small case, uh, I would, I would, uh, that I, I, I discussed this, um, you see that inhabitants are both seeing themselves as authority. So it is actually authoritative letters. So these are not letters which are asking, so they questioning, saying, for example, the one that, that we do have critical comments on whether this project is deserving to be price awarding. On the other hand, you know, there are those who are agreeing. So uh, to, 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 to summarize, I think we need to probably, it, would, it helps to look uh, into unusual places to find um, this uh, communication, discussion, reflection, which might be slightly different than, than we think about, um, let's put it liberal context. So liberal and illiberal context, if that would help to distinguish. So that's what's probably what I, what, I mean, what I learned from, from my research. I would like to answer as well. Um, I think that uh, discourse has a huge influence even in restricted socialist states. And discourse by definition is results from multiple sources, from multiple actors. 
One example from East Germany, the word recon reconstruction, reconstruction in the 1960s was mainly applied to plans that proposed demolition of old buildings and rebuilding in a modern style. The same word in the 1980s was increasingly used for smooth um, uh, renovation, basically, historic neighborhoods that were just upgraded and renovated. So just the, the change of the language, the change of the signification of this particular word, reconstruction, had an influence, and that resulted not from a party decree. Likewise, in Elblanc, I would say the fact that uh, the plans were promoted as a retroversion um, stressing continuity rather than reinvention uh, uh, had a significant influence uh, on the, that they were largely reviewed as positive. Yes, and uh, might I add, I'm a bit on a delay here, so I'm sorry if I'm uh, speaking into your discussion. Um, coming back to the aspect of public opinion, um, there were a lot of uh, kind of grassroots movements and activist groups in East Germany advocating for the historic city centers and um, they had names like Friends of the Historic City Center and they did from uh, hands-on conservation up to uh, research that they did, they did by their own as, as non-professionals, you have to say, and um, eventually they played a major role in uh, the demonstrations that brought down the Berlin Wall. But um, they were actually opposing those construction that I just showed, uh, for example, in the city of Halle. And their opposition, I don't know, might have been also a, a key for the design that uh, uh, was built in the end. Because on the one hand, they took the history of the people because a lot of buildings were demolished for the new construction, like going back to medieval times. But um, on the other hand, they tried to give them back a kind of history and a kind of image of a historic city. I, I would like to continue with uh, Florian and Elblong. Uh, it's a very interesting example, uh, really. I usually use it for students uh, teaching in what's urban heritage and how to, what's um, what's important element in urban heritage. But you mentioned uh, this uh, well-known uh, Polish school of uh, conservation, and I'm interested um, how was the reaction among professionals? Because in comparison, this uh, reconstruction of Warsaw Old Town and others that happened in the 50s, this was completely different approach, although it still has a very strong impression of historic town. So how was the debate? Was it and how was it perceived among professionals? Do you have this knowledge? Well, the sources that I have read largely perceived it as positive. And I mean, in contrast to the Nikolai Viertel, where you people said, oh, that's socialist Disneyland, um, Erblank was perceived as positive. I would have to say that, that the merit of the um, Polish School of Conservation is basically to, or has been in this particular context, to, to anticipate an, a concept of expanded heritage. Um, the acceptance or increasing acceptance of, of reconstructions as something that is legitimate. And it's not, and again, there, there is a long prehistory. It did not only start with, with, with Jan Zachwatowicz's famous dictum that the deliberate um, destruction of cultural values cannot be accepted, as in the Germans house by house destroying Roswell Old Town. Um, you had similar approaches already in interwar Poland. So, um, you also obviously in light of destructions of the First World War, you know, Kalish and so on. Um, so, the continuity, the, the ex continuous expansion of uh, the historic conservation discourse away from the monument and away from the object is something that sort of plowed the ground. Um, people like, like uh, um, uh, Maria Lubosko Hoffman was, was obviously trained as a conservationist and she had read, you know, all the classics from Ruskin to Dehio who said, uh, conserve, don't reconstruct, you know. 
and nonetheless she could rely on this general acceptance of the possibility of rebuilding something historical which is then still considered historical so this expanded view and i would say that this had a strong influence on the project as a whole despite the fact that it was hardly ever named as such at the time Um, I have a special question for Kirsten, um, because Halle is such a special case. I visited uh, Halle Neustadt uh, about a year ago, um, and so I'd like I'd like to talk uh, about the opposition, but um, the opposition from the other side, from the side from the party members and the industry, especially. Um, well, Halle was a special case because all other um, VBK in uh, East Germany were uh, switching, oh, had already switched to um, uh, VB Zipsich, uh, and um, in, in Halle they still produced uh, P2 until the very end of the uh, socialist period. Um, how did they react to this enforcement of um, experiments? As you said, well, it, it was it was more difficult to to place rails in the middle of the city. Did they have any kind of um, uh, word against it? Um, I think it, it, is, it is an important, and um, maybe it's a bit about the structure. Uh, I have, for some reason, um, understanding that these VBK were kind of powerful enterprises, um, deciding about the future of the city. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. It's um, an interesting one. Yeah, in fact, um, in Halle, they still build with the uh, so-called P Halle, which was the, the one uh, panel system that they also used for the new town. And uh, they took it inside of the historic city, which was at the one hand uh, uh, an advantage because they had uh, smaller elements because the uh, WBS70 you uh, mentioned uh, had this kind of axis from uh, six meters and here you had smaller um, axis from uh, I think 240 and 360 so it was uh, better uh, to adjust to the uh, city context and uh, the smaller streets and um, yeah in that sense the 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 VBK, the, the um, building combine, they uh, enforced kind of the development of this uh, building series to adapt to the historical context. And they found these new elements to like the conical ones or the uh, orioles and uh, lodges to, to fit into this historic context. And uh, I actually didn't... Uh, see any evidence of a strong uh, word against that from officials. So it was more, um, uh, yeah, they were very surprised when they first saw this uh, building line that I've shown with the brick infills with the uh, broken pediments. So they were more, <laughs> more surprised by the design and by the effort it took because it wasn't the, the panel facade, but they were uh, building it uh, on site in bricks. So this was more an opposition. But um, Halle had the uh, advantage that the system of people, like the real the actors, not the institutions, but the actors, had a very strong network also with other districts. And there was kind of this um, very... Um, warm and heartful competition going on with the city of Rostock, where they uh, tried similar experiments to how far can you get with the panel inside of the city center. So I would say that there wasn't this strong opposition because um, it was clear to everybody on, on every level that you had to go into the city centers. You couldn't uh, do nothing and still build uh, on the outskirts of the city. Yeah, um, I just wanted uh, to jump in uh, for a second uh, with um, this story of uh, a city um, uh, called Dubno in Ukraine. Um, it was 
very similar concept to what we've seen um, about um, Halle, um, about Elblong. And um, the, the issue there, I think there was not the design that, that was going to lead to the question of mine, is that was, it's not the problem of the design, but in, in the context of the Ukrainian SSR, they also proposed this human scale, very varied facades, different techniques of implementation, um, diverse um, structures, and also pedestrian routes, as well as some of the buildings um, considered as historical heritage to be preserved, and so on. But um, to my uh, unexpected result, when I visited the city, I didn't feel that people um, have any perception of this being um, somebody's effort to preserve the central city. So they still kind of feel that this part, which is reconstructed by Soviets, this is some kind of something alien, something that was uh, kind of inside in the city and is not working properly as a part of the of the of the urban environment and in somehow of course I understand them because the quality of the of the project and also how it looks like it's not that that high of of the cases presented before but for me it's it's like this this comparison this blur uh, or this integration of this uh, late 80s architecture in the cities um, so on the one hand there is this is the question of whether people should have the notion of a difference, whether sh they should have this feeling of the urban space being different, something reinvented, something reconstructed, or uh, should it rather um, be um, in the way of blurring with the with the scheme, blurring with the city as a as a whole, kind of um, developing it just just further or or keeping it um, in a similar way as it was before both in the expert view and in the kind of citizen's apprehension and, um, well, use of this space and perception. It's, it's I think, both to Kirsten and Florian and perhaps also to Sofia. You can jump in if okay. someone would like to react. Kristen? Yeah, I can I give a short reaction that, um, yeah, I think in... in Halle, the uh, intention was to, to blur uh, within the city and to uh, build upon the characteristics of the city that it had before. But um, this was the intention. But I think the same thing happened, uh, that it was uh, perceived as something different uh, by the people because they knew what was there before because it was kind of demolished uh, a couple of years before or even uh, during the Second World War. But there were still people living there who had, uh, which, uh, yeah, who had this memory. So I think those sites uh, were there at the same time. I think in El Blanc, the, the focus was on continuity, that the superficial presentation was, we rebuilt the city, full stop. And then you have to look at the details to actually see that it wasn't such e so easy. Um, if, if I may join, while you know, my case was not about rebuilding, I think that what Alexander may you know, point is actually how um, the city at some point or with some of years is imagined as a whole with different parts which all have if value stories and uh, and actually how we see city as elements and then how we hierar make hierarchy of these elements. So when, I mean, part of, I mean, my research is actually how you go in the city which is incorporated and next from valuing something small, like medieval part, and then saying that, um, precisely what Natalia started, what is the past, what is the heritage? and then how it expands and like five the 70s even the courtyards from the 19th century apartment buildings are somehow incorporated and they are not incorporated as on their own terms but rather in the way city is seen as a unity you know and uh, um, and then we think that we can actually think how do we being in 2021, looking at the architecture of the 80s or the architecture, Soviet architecture, and then doing these distinctions and then doing hierarchies, 
we split all the fragment the city uh, by attaching hierarchical values. Well, what is oldest is the best. What is, um, you know, how, and I think in this, so therefore I think this, this discussion of, also of post, I mean, of the late socialist period can be really helpful maybe in reflecting how we do evaluate, but also disintegrate the places you live. Because uh, the late socialist period, in a way, is an example of expanding repertoire. Whether we think about the technique of reconstruction or restoration, or actually we think about the, the, the canon of what is um, appreciated and what is included. Um, so that's probably would be my comment on your, on your question. Uh, if I may jump in here as well. Because all the time, like we are looking into the past uh, and different stories from the past, different narratives from the past, uh, at some point become for us more relevant than the others. And it tells us a lot about who we are today and uh, whom we would like to be tomorrow. And sure, this constellation changed all the time. And that's why it was my first remark about like w what... Uh, what for we are looking in the past? What is relevant for us and what was relevant for other actors, the architects and urban planners and urban designers? And my question to all of the speakers would be probably with all this growing interest into the past, in the history, let's to reshaping of the professional field. Because it's not only about architects who are now designing into the future from the scratch. It's about architects who need to negotiate with historians, with archaeologists, which has to do some research in order to uh, link their projects to uh, existing structure to make this, uh, this project more integrated uh, with the past as well. So uh, have, have their uh, authority or was their authority challenged at all? Have they renegotiated it in the constellation of new actors? And was it maybe also um, a conflict between those actors? And um, for me personally, the story of a head conservator could be a, a very interesting case uh, and the possible tension between the architects who want to build uh, um, from the scratch or for the conservator who want to preserve as much as possible. So this inattention that might uh, might be in the field, uh, was it visible for you uh, based on your research? And uh, was it somehow reflected by your actors? Lots of questions at the same time. <laughs> quite, quite difficult to answer. Um, I would say history is always contested and narratives are always to a certain extent constructed. So um, I think the most obstinate struggles you would get in nationalist contexts because any nationalist ideology necessarily has to um, blind out so many um, different uh, alternative views, but you would find it also in other, you know, dominant uh, uh, paradigms, be it, um, uh, be it, be it uh, like racial definitions or be it gender definitions and so on. So uh, I don't think that, that there is a way out of this uh, and, and part of the negotiation of history, well, it's part of, 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 of urban life to negotiate history. I do see at an international level that uh, possibly the need to build within the old is far stronger in Europe than it is in other parts of the world, simply because the, um, the, 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 the relation between like um, whatever, you know, a city such as Vienna, where the majority of people still live in buildings that are older than 80 years, is, is unique around the world. You wouldn't have to have that in almost no Asian country or, or, or wherever. So, so that's the, the question in those countries is probably more than historical 
versus non-historical, and it is not these very specific, um, uh, you know, redefinitions of the entire urban space. It comes then to 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 historical definitions of of particular areas. But I see also another um, uh, somewhat contradiction that you say the more that. Uh, that historic conservation is expanded and expanded for good reasons, you know, uh, moving away from the object. I mean, there were good reasons why to move away from the object because of the inherent, you know, Europe Eurocentric uh, white male superiority aspect that you have with this entire definition of the, the monument as something that is an object. So you move away from this towards uh, atmosphere, towards ensembles, towards practices, material heritage, immaterial heritage, and so on. Like all this uh, uh, redefinition over the course of the last 50 years, at the same time came with a loss of influence of the conservation authorities. So you would see that even even such a such a prized uh, uh, um, definition, such as the, uh, um, the, 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 the the list of, of world, the UNESCO list of world heritage, it was expanded for very good reasons, but now it's so big that it's become less and less important for a lot of people. So that, again, is a, a contradiction that is possibly hard to, uh, to resolve. Um. I don't know, maybe I should, you know, comment on your question about the, the figure of architect and building new. And I think that it's a part that comes from the representation of architecture that there is an author. But I think if you know from research, there is never, you know, author architect is never ever alone. So there is a, it's a very collective effort. And then we speak about socialist context, you know, whether we see the different periods and, uh, and settings. So uh, I, it might be a question, you know, whether it's a limited authority of author or shared authority, you know, it's just up to us, you know, researchers to, 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 to interpret. And, you know, whether, you know, for example, the architect in the 50s would have to renegotiate more with the with the director of the plant and in the 70s more with the with the um, preservation um, experts uh, I think that's what is interesting how it's it's uh, the practice which is multi-participatory very uh, very embedded with power with relations with dynamics um, and therefore so fascinating because you can through that, look into a broader beyond the building you can actually through the building look into the into into social um uh, relations and uh, um that's basically would be uh, uh, my, my comment here oh. yeah and if i uh, also might add that uh, in terms of reshaping the field as you asked i think that it wasn't a kind of a reshaping because uh, those architects coming from a background where they had a very good education actually also in terms of history uh, but uh, university uh, was a completely different field than uh, practice and now I think in the 1980s, uh, part of their education came into their practice uh, again. So they were, I think, uh, from what I learned from uh, interviews with the architects, they were actually eager to design in this historic environment. They uh, were eager to actually design again and uh, to find uh, site-specific solutions. So that was more or less uh, a kind of improvement for the profession of the architect and we, uh, the 1980s are also a time where we see that they are named in the magazines and that's not only one name for a collective is stated but like everyone up until the one who was responsible for the statics or the um, the landscape architecture and 
so I would uh, more or less see that the uh, conservation experts had the weakest voice in, in those kind of developments at that time. So if you ask them, then they would say, well, okay, it played a major role, conservation and the, and the history, but actually we didn't get our, uh, our goals because there was a lot more demolition than there was actually in the plan for those sites and a lot more historic buildings uh, yeah, also were uh, torn down in construction because it was easier without them. I see there are questions and oh, like comments on the audience. I would maybe suggest that we close this uh, circle of uh, uh, panelists. So I think I can also speak from my side briefly and then we, we open up. Uh, I might not be directly addressing your question here, but uh, <laughs> it has inspired me to think. Uh, so the idea that I had is that like, maybe based on the material that I was presenting, it is interesting to see like, uh, from this example of Ukraine, like if you would like with all seriousness to erase certain memory, not conserve it, and you have also to act somehow professionally and be very comprehensive in that. And when this, this movement goes from bottom up to completely state-led, let's say, um, well, you one might answer, one might wonder like who may be interested in the knowledge like that, but I think it is surprisingly relevant, like, I would not be surprised if, like, in the United States, they come to the same problems, let's say, if they also want, with all seriousness, to erase the legacy, let's say, of slavery, for example. Uh, and I think that they also have the same challenges, because we, we were we having a conversation with Brenton about that, and he was telling me how much these divisions are in great in the just in the zoning of American cities, not, not, not even coming down to, to certain symbols or status. So I think that this Ukrainian, like the titanic push to try and to kind of overturn things all of a sudden to destroy like basically the legacy that constitutes the majority of urban environment here. Like it is both ridiculous, but it's also very, I think, insightful. And of course, it dates back to some, I know, like Tamnato Memoria is a concept that exists from ancient times. But like, uh, I, I'm not sure like whether there are many examples like that that would be contemporary and also based somehow on the contemporary tools such as legislation. And I think that Ukrainian cases showcase basically a complete lack also of professionalism when it comes to dealing with architecture basically and, and urban design. We can see these annotations that were made, let's say, uh, it's uh, so surprising they, they they never match even in terms of quality. If like it comes to very basic things, I think it's interesting to think about that. Uh, I would like to continue the the thought that Sofia. Uh, kind of was a comment on a comment, uh, but I would like to step out of this uh, heritage field uh, because, well, nowadays we are seeing how the definition of heritage changes and uh, how it also influences the preservation of, uh, of heritage. But actually each uh, of the presentations today and yesterday put uh, um, uh, important insight of the um, profession of architects or the uh, profession of architecture, uh, architecture per perceived in this broadened field as, uh, for example, Lukasz describes it uh, in his book. And uh, from that point of view, the m socialist modernism seems as a, a very narrow field of practice and then uh, the step into the postmodern architecture uh, mean that uh, architects adapt many different competences uh, regarding to the task they are at hand uh, at the certain moment. Mm, and uh, this broadening of the discipline uh, was at least kind of uh, in from you know, my P Polish point of view, uh, also something that prepared them, in fact, into uh, this global uh, exercising of uh, architecture. But uh, I would like to be uh, put this uh, 
well, uh, what also I would like to bring here is that what would, the difference was in the socialist countries uh, that many architects pointed out that when they were modernists or forced to do the modern architecture, um, they were just kind of um, artisans. But uh, the postmodern uh, brought them kind of freedom. They could label themselves artists again. Uh, what, is, uh, what was absolutely crucial for many, uh, many of those practitioners. I believe it was rather a comment, but uh, Dimitri, would you like to pose the last question during this circle of discussion? Uh, yeah, I've <laughs> been so much, so many times today, so maybe if someone wants to have, ask a question, I can give the microphone to them. Nobody. Well, um, it's, it's a bit of it's a question to Florian um, and Igor, but I think maybe it's 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 a larger issue. Um, um, the Florian was talking about it, it's a, what, what I see it as a, a reclamation of animus land in a sense, because it used to be a German territory, um, and uh, I would I would I would, I would like to see a very special case of Kaliningrad, who turned a very like Soviet Russian city. Um, and they completely sort of ignore the uh, ignore the German heritage, uh, and ended up building something in the spirit of the 80s, just a couple of years ago. Uh, it looks even shabbier. Um, so, um, how was this? Uh, and, and in the case of Kiev, I think it's also about some kind of reclamation of. Um, uh, animus, animus land, because these symbols, uh, they now experienced, seen as, as, um, as foreign. Um, how difficult this process is, uh, um, and the question is, uh, how did they solve that? Was it an issue uh, in, in, in Germany? Uh, is it a special case, or cities like Gdansk were a similar one? And uh, was a, like a postmodern solution a specific type of solution for this kind of problem? Um, your interpretation sounds convincing, but nonetheless, I would have a different one. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I like according to my research, the the sort of political reconstruction in in in, in Poland uh, lost significance in the 1960s. What you mentioned in Gdańsk, it is still quite strong, where you have this like selective reconstruction and these attributions that the whatever the Baroque period was considered Polish because at the time Gdańsk was part of the Polish kingdom, whereas the 19th century when it was part of, uh, of, of, of Prussia uh, uh, was considered German and so on, therefore Baroque is better than historicism and so on. Like these political attributions somewhat lost significance in the 1970s and it's obviously also like a generation change that 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 the Polish inhabitants, well, that majority at the time then was already born in Elblanc, was perceiving the city as naturally there. There was no doubt of the Polishness anymore, as it had been possibly in the early post-war period. So that changed. But um, so so this kind of you know historic conservation as an as a reattribution, I don't think it would apply to Elblanc. What does apply, actually, is that postmodern architecture or this kind of postmodernism was a solution for this particular contradictory um, situation. On the one hand, longing for this continuity. On the other hand, precisely not having it because of the upheavals and the destruction and all that. So to have the cake and eat it. Yeah, if any of the speakers have some final remarks, it is exactly the moment to say them out loud. I think, and I, I, I'm less sure how actually this question sounds in relation to Kiev, because I think like uh, there are two aspects. One is that Kiev just another is just another post-socialist city, and I think what happens with this legacy in all post-socialist cities 
uh, or even in socialist times already, it was really well described by Alexei Yurchak in this book, everything was forever until it was no more. That basically, people become so fed up that they become blind to this ideological significance of certain utilitarian routine elements of urban space. Uh, in the case of this more kind of um, reclamation of Kiev as historical national capital of Ukraine, of course, there, there had to be some emphasis and as I think we tried to demonstrate in, in, in our presentation, like um, basically the authorities of Ukraine hijacked some part of this uh, heritage produced by the Soviets. And this is why I'm so suspicious about this historical whole historical narrative, because it was produced by the Soviets for Soviet purposes. I think it is uh, necessary to address it uh, critically, really think what, because we, we really like, we are happy to celebrate this kind of Kiev and Rus somehow significance or start of the Orthodox uh, uh, religion uh, in, uh, in 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 uh, among Eastern Slavs, but what 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 does it really mean? And also, I think that uh, throughout this whole uh, research, I always always had the feeling that um, there used to be always like you say, like everything was basically it was not a foreign power; it was the local power, and there used to be a Ukrainian state within USSR. And it was formally independent, and I think, but it was also, in many respects, a facade, just a facade that was stripped of the decision-making power that was that could be somehow national, but only to certain very limited extent. And these extents were always like the boundaries were so, 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 so rigid uh, always. So, so I always had this feeling that like it was basically both uh, the domestic product, but also the foreign product. I don't know if, how, how to explain it. Like it probably we don't have time for it here, but uh, yeah. So I don't think that it's still perceived as completely foreign, but maybe of course some parts of this legacy became very marginalized to a ridiculous extent, such as Lenin. Like there are no Lenins in, in Ukraine, although there is plenty of other heritage. So it was very selective. Um, I may maybe I can join here because of this alien and. Um I mean, the city, the, the city of Lviv, which was formerly Polish. Um, and that actually was also something that I kind of tried to hint at the, my concluding notes, that this return to the uh, like historical turn in architecture, thinking about the city, it actually can be quite insightful if we look at, at different socialist countries, because they emerged partly, largely, partly with the shift of borders and displacement of population. So I think it actually can be interesting like, twist into how you can go into the past when past is actually problematic. At the same time, you go there because you live, people did live. And I think that what, what is interesting between, between um, um, like 80s, 70s and 80s, actually think, about them in terms of post-war moment, like long post-war moment, it takes time. So the, the, the story of El Blanc, of Wroclaw, or Lviv, or Kaliningrad, the, the new beginning required rejection. And then the living in the place required accommodation. And then if you think about after 91 moment, while uh, there's no that much of displacement, uh, some borders did change, however, it was still in presentation a new moment. So after 81 was a new, uh, like a zero, so something or after 91. And it required like alienation and rejection. And in a way, we may be like still living in this 90, post 1989, 90, 91 moment uh, and being physically surrounded by material structures coming, it forces us to think about them, whether, you know, whether we are, I mean, somebody is a preservationist or somebody is an anthropologist or somebody is a historian, or somebody is uh, an inhabitant or somebody who purchased the apartment in this or that building. So I think it's also this figure, it's important therefore while we focus on specific decades, the 80s, for example, 
all this after modernism is also like seeing these longer trajectories whether they are placed in a in in, in a development that crosses um this um uh, turns you know that that's would probably be my comment here um yeah so uh, i think we're coming to a concluding moment of the of the sessions of this day um and i like really to say many thanks to everybody presenting today um we're gonna have a half an hour break and there are also journals meaning mean a little bit you know fresh air then you know walk around uh for yourself and then we'll have a concluding discussion about how to preserve the preservationist legacy and and all this preservation conservation things connected to archiving the archives and and these things because in ukraine we have a lot of troubles with that honestly in, in every sense we have a lot of work to do um and perhaps um also we'll let learn from the Lithuanian experience or think about Lithuanian experience on, on this issue and maybe um, also conclude with some positive ideas or some positive remarks on how institutions could cooperate and think forward um, to uh, create this or to make sense of this period for greater make uh, greater public. Um, so for our, our online listeners, we'll be back in 30 minutes and this will be the concluding session and Thank you.